We're going to get a short break here. When we come back, we're going to talk with the author of a new book uh, that uh, focuses on the idea of evaluation. Uh, and the, uh, he's the director of evaluation of the School of Education and School of Medicine at Stanford and had been there for 25 years before writing his new book. We'll be back in just a moment with Financial Spectrum. And it's uh, written by David Fetterman. David Fetterman is the president and CEO of Fetterman and Associates, an international evaluation consulting firm. He's a Stanford alum and uh, has 25 years of experience at Stanford, including serving as director of evaluation in the School of Education and School of Medicine. He's a director of Arkansas Evaluation Center at the University of Arkansas in Pine Bluff. And uh, over 25 years of service, he held positions in Stanford's administration, School of Education, and School of Medicine. He's also past president of the American Evaluation Association and a recipient of the association's highest honors in theory and practice. His uh, recent books look at include Empowerment Evaluation Principles in Practice and and Ethnography. I think I pronounced that properly. Um, uh, This is uh, 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 pretty intense stuff. And uh, throughout his work, you just see the word evaluation over and over again. Um, I want to welcome to the program David Fredman. Hi, David. Hi, thanks for having me. I appreciate you being willing to spend the time with us. And uh, have you all always had this gift of evaluation? Because clearly you've been involved in that your whole career. Well, it's interesting. Um, in one way or another, I think, of course, all of us are evaluators, uh, whether it's using consumer reports or okay. you know, assessing our, our, uh, our cars or our mates. So I've been involved in it uh, since early, early grad school uh, experience and for the last uh, two or three decades now. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and now tell us about Fetterman and Associates, because that's, that's since your time, the time you put in since being in academia. Now you're with a private consulting firm. Tell us about Fetterman and Associates. Sure, thanks. Uh, I have been doing Fetterman and Associates actually for about 25 years concurrently. Oh, okay. Uh, with All being right. a professor at the same time. But uh, we do international ev- evaluation and domestic. So we'll come into a school and ask, uh, can we be of assistance? and helping them get their scores a little higher, better education, just moving forward, more efficient. We work in hospitals, uh, mm-hmm. doing the same thing, preparing uh, uh, medical students to be uh, good physicians for us. Uh, I work in Arkansas, uh, helping with tobacco prevention with minority kids. We do a lot of work wow. helping people assess where they are and very often teach them how to assess themselves so that they have an ongoing process of self-assessment mm-hmm. and improving their program performance. Now, the, the word, another word that I struggled with to pronounce and not having practiced it was ethnography, if I said that yeah. right. That obviously is a term that's important in your most recent work. Could you describe ethnography for us? Sure, sure. It seems es- es- kind of uh, esoteric, but all it really is, it's, a, um, it's a, an art and a science of um, observing, but from a qualitative perspective and from the insider's perspective. So you're trying to describe as accurately as you can, what you see in a classroom, what you Mm -hmm. see in a hospital, what you see in a business. Um, And you get it not just from the external expert's perspective, but from the insider's perspective of reality. Mm -hmm. Because even if you don't agree with that inside perception of reality, uh, there are real consequences. Just for example, when I worked in a psychiatric ward in a VA hospital, uh, a lot of these guys thought they could fly. Not like you and me flying a plane, I mean fly. And uh, you may not agree with that, and I may not agree with that, but there are real-world consequences for that perception of reality if they're on the third floor and there are no bars on the window. Yeah. So what I look at is not just objective reality, but the perception of reality, and ethnography is a tool to get at that inside information. Okay. And, uh, and, and finally, you know, just setting the stage here, 
Obviously, you've been studying the work of, uh, of Hewlett-Packard Stanford University, the, the collaboration there uh, to work with three specific communities and try to, to build a wireless network that's available to them. Uh, is that something you were involved in, or you came in afterwards and helped to evaluate its effectiveness? Uh, they, they asked me to come in. It's interesting. Let me just give you... They asked me to come in and do the evaluation of all the, the entire program using an approach I came up with called empowerment evaluation, which I'll, I'll describe in a second. But it's teaching people basically how to assess their, their own performance. Okay. But let me just mention briefly the way the world is sort of upside down in relation to that question. I was first working on a similar project in one of the communities, and a local foundation didn't think we were going fast enough and didn't like the results. Uh, they weren't moving uh, in, the, in the pace they had in mind. So they were not as interested in, uh, in uh, keeping us funded. I'll just be very honest about what happened. Mm -hmm. So the corporation, not the foundation, the corporation, you Packard, came to me. I was a, a professor at Stanford and running the Master's in Policy Analysis Evaluation Program. So I had a lot of my students all over the place in the Bay Area for uh, internships. They came over to me and said, David, you know, we like what you're doing. We realize it takes longer to invest in people and have them take responsibility and build their own businesses. Uh, we want to uh, fund you to, to evaluate all of this times three uh, around the country. So, of course, I said, well, what's your interest? And, I, and they said very bluntly, to make money. Yeah. So I said, well, that's blunt, but I'm still not sure I want that as a response to helping people and social change as the only criteria anyway. And they said, don't worry. Uh, we're not interested in forcing people to buy software or hardware that they don't need. We just want to have a lot of branding so that when we give them equipment, they may remember mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. later down the road when they're very successful. I said, that's, that's a reasonable bargain. Yeah. And that's how I started entering into working with them from the beginning. And, and what empowerment evaluation does as a tool, it helps people uh, use evaluation as part of the planning and management of their operation. Instead of being separate and parasitic and people don't want it, it's more, this is what you do to run a business, yeah. run a school, to run a social program. It makes evaluation feedback just normal part of your daily operations. Okay. And that's how I got introduced to this whole process, working with them. And I became what's called a critical friend, someone who believes in what they're doing, but because I believe in the concept of the program, I'm even more critical of their operations because I want it to work. So I'll give them additional feedback more sure. than they would normally get. Sure. So in other words, you're going to you're going to come at them with brutal honesty about how effective and how uh, uh, how pervasive it is in terms of empowering the people of those communities. Yeah, I try. You know, you remain diplomatic, and you because uh, you want to have. A, if you're not too diplomatic, you're not going to have any. No one's going to listen. But you're very straightforward. Like you say, <laughs> brutally true. honest about yeah. here's where things are. Uh, they're not. You're not making uh, around the corner fiscally, or you're not making it around educationally. Whatever's going on, mm -hmm. um, here are some suggestions. But let me hear your suggestions. I ask the community, and we work on on those strategies and monitor those and alter them as necessary. It's interesting. You're talking about, uh, from what I understand, a 15 million dollar uh, project that was the work of Hewlett Packard and Stanford. And uh, why those particular communities, East Palo Alto, San Diego, and Baltimore, what led them to choose those communities? Well, they all had to compete with some sort of idea of how to improve their own communities from a technological perspective. That was pretty much the, the requirement. And these are the groups that came up with the most cohesive idea of where they should go. For example, the Tribal Digital Village. They ended up building the largest unlicensed wireless system in the country, according to the uh, former head of the uh, FCC, uh, unlicensed because they're a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. They also built a digital printing press. So they had the potential to do tremendous things and, and actually pulled it off. Um, similarly, East Palo Alto and Baltimore, they had very powerful messages in their proposals uh, that suggested they could make an impact on their school systems from a technological perspective, and all of them, had a pretty good case for making technologically oriented small businesses. It was a very entrepreneurial uh, uh, kind of operation or initiative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so out of this, did they actually see? Did, w w the, w did the results include a lot of new initiatives? Uh, some did, did it attract yeah. venture capital where uh, s uh, small startup enterprises could thrive? Yeah, it was very it, well. It's a let's put it this way: it's a very unsanitized book, very honest book. So, in some cases, very successful. I mean, right through the roof, phenomenal stuff, like building the largest wireless system in the country, selling part of the bandwidth, 
uh, to, to subsidize uh, some of their other activities educationally, uh, establishing a, 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 um, a digital printing press, mm -hmm. uh, attracting additional sources of money both from the government for uh, uh, e-learning as mm -hmm. well as mm -hmm. uh, from uh, private sources. On the other hand, we're also very honest about what didn't work. Um, it was not all smooth sailing and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I should say another positive is that Baltimore and East Palo Alto were able to help transform their school system simply by introducing hundreds of laptops to the kids and mm. teachers, but not really just distributing them. They also provided training, guidance on how to use them and build it into the curriculum. And it started changing the whole nature of where kids were looking and what teachers were doing with their educational programs. Mm. So those are super positives. Now, let me mention where it didn't work, if I could. Yeah. I'd like to be honest that it's not all... None of this is smooth sailing. We make many mistakes. I should be. I should say right up front. Uh, uh, for every success, there's definitely a number of errors or missteps. But you pull it around using this approach called empowerment evaluation, where you're constantly reassessing everything you're doing mm -hmm. uh, to see if you're on track. But one just quick example of a misstep: uh, one of the sites uninvited the host, the HP. Now you don't hear of that too often and still wow. survive in business or in education. Uh, that was a major faux pas. Uh, now, HP, to their credit, at the time said, no, no, we understand. We believe in more local control, which is a lot of what this is about. Mm -hmm. People are not going to be able to develop and sustain anything unless they actually take charge of their own lives. And uh, that, that actually was true for this entire initiative. But they said, you know, they're not ready for us, so of course they, they don't want to waste anyone's time and uh, they're pushing us back. And quite frankly, that was a major mistake. Okay. All of us sort of said, that's a red flag. Whether you're ready or not, let's take a look is what should have happened. Because what happened is they became emboldened to think they could turn anyone, un anyone away and any resource that there was offered to them away. And it put them at a disadvantage uh, uh, position for months and months and months. Wow. Wow. Now, uh, so we've made some, they made some major, major uh, mistakes along the way, which now in retrospect we would not let happen for any kind of replication or duplication of this kind of effort. Well, when you're doing something so fresh and new, it stands to reason that there would be some mistakes. And uh, did they were able to shift gears and about face pretty quickly on that? Yeah, I, I would say unfortunately because of a crisis mode, yes. Okay. So what happened, right. and this happens very often with a lot of nonprofits I work with and organizations I work with uh, and companies, um, they'll get to a crisis mode of realizing they're not getting anywhere near the goals or the benchmarks they had established. Um, and in fact, they're almost irretrievably behind. Mm -hmm. So they call, in this case, they called us in. We were the evaluators, but the way it worked is we had to work with their permission that they felt comfortable with us, and they called us in before they called HP. Okay. So they, and the deal was, we're not going to say anything to HP, and HP understood that, until you're ready for us to talk to them. But we're here to help you. Basically, we're very much like, like you, I guess, a financial advisor. We can assist people to move forward mm -hmm. and plan and achieve their objectives, but there's no guarantee. They have yeah. to listen to us, and the market's the market. You know, it's not, not a perfect uh, science. But we basically yeah. are there to facilitate that through evaluation feedback. How so that's them, what we help them do yeah. and pull themselves together sort of near okay. the final end of the process. And they were able to at least meet all the minimum objectives, but huh. nowhere is near going right through the roof like the other um, digital villages. Okay. So uh, they did; they all pulled it, uh, uh, you know, off. But some very did phenomenally well, and some did all right, and some did just barely uh, making the minimum uh, requirements. Okay. How did the marriage of the private enterprise Hewlett Packard, who went through uh, the company went through a lot of uh, management changes and vision changes during that period of time? Uh, how did the partnership with Stanford University, a uh, long established, you know, widely regarded as probably the top education institution on the West Coast, how did that that uh, partnership work out? Well, it was very interesting. Um, Stanford and, and HP, as you know, are um, you know brother and sister type of thing. They came from uh, Stanford, both Hewlett and Packard. Mm. So there's been a long-standing relationship between them that sort of withstands the test of time, basically. Uh, not that it hasn't had issues and problems, as you're suggesting, that's for sure. But the more important ones at the time were um, acquisitions. Uh, just as a quick example, I don't know if you recall, but they were acquiring Compact in those yeah, days. Sure. 
and uh, that was a fiasco. I mean, uh, yep. you know, Carly did a great job in trying to orchestrate it, and it did end up very nicely, you know, down the road. But at the time, it was so disruptive to the company that it had a spillover effect on the initiative so that the equipment that we were mm-hmm. depending on to distribute to the classroom, to use as routers for towers, to connect with the towers, the wireless system, all the other things we were looking for were delayed. Well, that became a situation where a typical evaluator would blame the victim. They would say, oh, you guys aren't getting it off the ground in the tri- tribal digital village mm-hmm. or the Baltimore or the East Palo Alto digital village. When in fact, what it is, is a ripple effect or reflection of the distribution problems going on as a result of the disruption of acquiring um, compact yeah. and that slowing all of the deliveries uh, down, not just the ones related to the initiative. So you had to sort of study up, as uh, Laura Nader refers yeah. to it, rather than just studying down to see what the problem is. One of the, uh, we don't have a lot of time left, but I'm kind of curious from your perspective, having studied this, uh, evaluated it, and, and understood, you know, being neck deep in the heart of these uh, digital village uh, initiatives, there, there's a, a debate that's uh, I think is kind of slow moving about whether there should be a nationwide wireless network available to everybody uh, versus the private sector on a, on a piecemeal and on a, on a regional basis uh, making internet available to people, you know, whether it's through the cable or, or, or through phone companies, whatever it may be. Do you believe that there should be virtually free wireless internet available across the country? Uh, yes, but not only the country, but internationally. I work in Japan, I work in Nepal, I work in South Africa. Mm. Um, I, I work all around the world. I uh, just got back from Korea. And um, there's no question we're a global family, uh, whether we recognize it or not. And in spite of the issue of the fiscal cliff and everything else going on, um, we're a much closer family than we may not we may recognize. If we even look at our clothing, you can see it comes from every part of the world. Yeah. Uh, not just the United States. So the answer to your question first, yes, throughout the United States, we should have free Internet, no question about it. it is, uh, we can, we've already seen what this does to the country to have a digital disadvantage mm-hmm. uh, where some folks have access and some folks do not have access. For the digital villages that I worked with, the Internet lit the way out of the digital darkness for many, for employment, for education, yeah. um, health, everything. So I would agree 100%, but I would extend it a little further that we have to start thinking in a more global terms as far as Internet use. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a challenge because you've got a lot of companies who've uh, invested an awful lot of capital to establish the network, and uh, they need to make up for those costs, and you're talking about a, a system that would basically push the private sector out of the way. And uh, so it's, it's probably not coming anytime soon, but something that is uh, it continually arising in political debate. True, although I think one alternative may be, uh, and Google might be part of that answer, since they're exploring things like Korea right now, uh, North Korea, in fact. I work in South Korea. Mm. Um, But I think what a lot of companies like Google and others are looking at right now uh, is how they would be extending their their own market for their own reasons. But they are interested in building their own infrastructure uh, that may be well beyond what any single government can do. Yeah, it's all fascinating. Uh, Listeners, uh, the name of the book, again, is Empowerment Evaluation in the Digital Villages, and it's Hewlett-Packard's $15 million race towards social justice, uh, written by David M. Fetterman. And, uh, David, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Fascinating study, and I highly recommend it. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Let's just stick around. Come back with a little bit of a market update just before Bloomberg Radio takes over at the top of the hour. Back in a moment with Financial Spectrum.